This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles, and I'm joined this week by our co-host, Jonathan Bennett, when we talk with Liam Broza of LifeScope. That's coming up next. Floss Weekly is brought to you from LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 589, recorded Wednesday, July 29th, 2020. Life Scope. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Melissa. Like expired milk, 30% of your customers' data goes bad every year. That's money down the drain. Visit Melissa's developer portal for free access to data quality APIs, demos, and code samples. Freshen up your sour data today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. Hi, everybody. I'm Doc Searles. Welcome to Floss Weekly. And uh, my uh, co-host this week uh, is Jonathan Bennett, the great Jonathan Bennett, who knows way more than I do and is far more, far more experienced on the show as well. Um, so, Jonathan, and uh, where are you right now? I can guess. Hey, hey, Doc. I'm st- still here in the uh, Flyover State of Oklahoma. I call it the corporate headquarters here at the home office. It's good to be with you today. Yeah, thank you. And and our um, our, our guest today is uh, is Liam Broza, who's um, I don't even know how to characterize him because he's he's so active in uh, in gaming and in, in VR and uh, uh, in uh, in the virtual worlds, um, doing so much creative stuff. Uh, uh, he's a uh, contributor of code to a great many things, and uh, it's just a it's just really great really great to have him here. Uh, and we'll bring him up after uh, after this message, which is that this show is brought to you um, by Melissa. Uh, and uh, have you ever forgotten to check the date on a carton of milk? Like milk, your customer data goes bad. In fact, up to 30% of customer data goes bad every year. Melissa makes sure your data is accurate and current so you reach the right customers at the right time. There are tools to help businesses maintain fresh data for over 35 years. You can add consumer demographic information to your records, such as property and mortgage data, even marital status and social media handles. Melissa helps you fill in the gaps by adding emails and phone numbers. And identifying current customers easily allows you to find prospective new customers through their prospect database. You verify your addresses, emails, phone numbers, and names in real time. Incorrect data entered by customers, simple human error, or duplicated records makes it easy for bad data to find its way into your system. Melissa can help you verify your data at the point of entry. You can also match and consolidate your records. Uh, Melissa's matching and deduplication tools help you uncover, merge, and purge hard-to-find duplicate records for an accurate 360-degree view of your customers. Their flexible deployment options offer different platforms to suit any preference, business, size, or budget. With flexible on-premise web service, secure FTP processing, and software as a service, uh, that's SaaS, of course, delivery options, you can choose the best way to meet your unique business needs. Melissa continuously undergoes independent security audits to reinforce their commitment to data security, privacy, and compliance requirements. They have the utmost dedication to your data's security by implementing strong controls and safeguards when processing your data. Over 10,000 businesses trust the address experts. Trust Melissa to be your foundation for data-driven success. Melissa is supporting communities and qualifying essential workers during COVID-19 as well. See if your organization qualifies for six months of free service by applying online. So don't put up with sour customer data today. Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log in, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. 
Okay, so welcome uh, to to Floss Weekly, and uh, and and howdy, uh, Liam Broza, who's our our guest this week, along with me and Jonathan. There's Liam, who I howdy. only discovered by by reading uh, that. Liam is the second half of William. I, I didn't. I didn't even notice that until I'd like known you for a long time. It's yeah. it, it's it's weird that way. So now, I mean, um, uh, LifeScope is your. I mean, I'm I'm trying to separate out all of the many things you do. I mean, if you, you're sure. You're it's, it's it's actually a much. So it's a pretty easy you're... story to tell. Yeah. Um, so I fell in love with computers in my teens. Uh, started in IT, then got into software, then spent my teens and early 20s uh, doing computer engineering and hardware, learning hardware definition languages, trying to make microchips, trying to make print circuit boards. And hardware was so hard, I went back into software. Um, and I really fell in love with uh, a lot of the theory behind computer science and a lot of the uh, way ways languages are written, the way uh, uh, data is stored and uh, mined at scale. And uh, I got uh, a job um, with a drop shipping company that was trying to scrape and index the net um, to like go, th go through all these different retail sites and understand prices everywhere um, and, and how the internet e-commerce system was, was working because nobody really knew uh, in the in the late uh, uh, 2000s, uh, we were doing stuff like that. Then I moved. I I was uh, I was in Baltimore at the time. Our, our company got picked up by a super large uh, <laughs> uh, top five tech company. Uh, I left. Uh, I left. Went back to school, and uh, uh, then uh, got uh, a job in a, at a defense contractor um, in Washington D.C. Uh, and was told that I could do pretty much uh, anything I wanted uh, as with databases and, and data. Uh, got really, really deep into uh, all of the, the best stuff that Microsoft was doing, all of their tech, uh, uh, doing certifications, uh, going through everything. And uh, I, fa I met uh, uh, a friend of mine, Steve, uh, who uh, was really into Java at the time and was, uh, you know, started build, you know, working uh, on Java and these ideas of building free applications that would run everywhere. And then as they got bought by Oracle, he moved, he went with all of his knowledge into the military, into this defense space. And uh, we became fast friends, started talking about uh, data and the internet and uh, how uh, the way that uh, software is created, the way that we actually search for information on the internet uh, is totally broken, and the, data, the entire internet could act as a giant database if we could just build maps of, of, it, of the topography of, of the information, how it was structured, how you got at it, how you asked questions, how, uh, you know, to this data set, how, uh, what the answers would look like. Um, and uh, we built an entire consultancy and a couple products out of that. Uh, one of them was uh, this uh, data aggregator, uh, uh, data uh, index uh, called BitScoop. It was like this middle layer that turned all these different sources of information uh, out on the web and on computer systems into one. And it made software development really easy because you only had like one major SDK. Um, there's a, uh, we've, uh, it's called BitScoop. And uh, when we built BitScoop, uh, we were deciding uh, kind of what would be the most killer app you could build on these developer tools because people wanted uh, data, they wanted data science reports mainly out of it. Uh, you know, they wanted to get a, uh, a critical report to the CTO every day and they needed to go through, you know, 1,300, 1,400 different software products that they, that they had and all the logs and all the files and databases inside of them to just generate a uh, report faster, better with more charts. Um, and uh, we were looking, um, like I, I've read a lot of computer history. Um, you know, Doc, we met uh, next to the Computer Science Museum, and there's been a lot of uh, ideas over the last 50 years of how would you build a personal information store? How would you build a personal knowledge store? Like electronic journal and 
and life logging is interesting, but the real interesting thing would be, could the computer just make your biography for you and make it like a personal search index? So we started playing around with uh, our general data aggregation technology um, and building an open source project that would just build a time series of everything you did, uh, every place you went, everyone you interacted with, everything physical in the world you interacted with or owned, you know, like your stuff, uh, everything digital in the world you created and consumed, and just making a giant timeline of that, an organized data graph that you search like Google, and it would have like instant search, you know, uh, real-time uh, text index. And uh, we called that LifeScope, and we made that a free and open source project on top of our time. And as we went to show it off, uh, people have uh, loved it and uh, wanted to integrate with it um, and uh, make it more and more uh, open source and co come closer to uh, free data standards. Um, and uh, one of the weird things that happened was uh, I'm in Southern California. You know, it's the land of Snapchat. It's the land of Silicon Beach. Uh, a lot of people who are doing computer vision and augmented reality, virtual reality, like you know, building for the Oculus Quest, which has four camera HD cameras that study your entire room in a 4D way, um, how you manage all this super sensitive data. Because we're all focused on like our chat history and our text messages, but the structural 3D information that you can get out of um, augmented reality, virtual reality, just photos and videos is insane. And uh, it's it's much it's a much harder privacy problem than I think most people understand. Uh, so we've been building some concepts around AR, VR, the spatial web, and privacy, and uh, ways you can make software that's distributed, that's better, that's on better standards. And right now uh, we're focused on uh, uh, actually virtual events. We've had a lot of people talk to us about. Uh, doing virtual events on the web, doing them in 3D, doing them privately, uh, to, uh, you know, um, all sorts of with security on on open standards, all these different things. Um, so we're a consultancy around uh, information uh, uh, management in the digital age. But yeah, we've the, our two big projects right now are LifeScope and uh, this uh, this virtual event platform we call XR3. Um, but yeah, yeah, we, that's, that's essentially what, uh, I do with my life. I program 60 hours a week, like a madman, uh, uh building all this stuff with a, with my team uh, and dumping it on open on GitHub with a MIT license. Yeah. Uh, and cause we're really into doing projects and making magical things happen for people. Um, and it's best to do that stuff collaboratively. I hope that's like a good, uh, introduction to what I do. It's a perfect 30,000 foot view of what all is going on. You, you Doc had a, had trouble trying to put this into words to start with, but what came to mind is you're kind of a, a modern renaissance man, a digital renaissance man, a whole bunch of things That's sound very interesting and, and you get to play with a lot of them. <laughs> Uh, what what you're doing, particularly with LifeScope, it reminds me very much of what Google did with the internet. You know, 20 years ago, they said, "Oh, there's all this information out there. What if there was a way to uh, categorize it and be able to search it very rapidly?" Uh, you guys are doing that with essentially people's personal data. Yeah. So um, right now we have uh, uh, an, uh, if you go to LifeScope.io and you sign up, uh, we make you. Uh, a personal database uh, up in the cloud, up on our Amazon fleet, um, using the open source tech that we have uh, on our GitHub page. We just take that stuff, bundle it up, deploy it to Amazon, and uh, and manage this personal encrypted database for you. Uh, you can connect uh, all the a bunch of services that we support: uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Dropbox, Spotify, all these companies with APIs. Uh, that you can like social sign in on, like connect with Facebook, for instance, get access to your friends, your photos, all that stuff. And we'll make a copy of all of that, an index. Um, and we're working uh, we're working to make it really easy to sync those those uh, uh, rich media files and everything to different sources, um, along with some other open source uh, attempts at this. Um, we we connect to all of your devices. So we make a Windows, Mac, iPhone, Android uh, native app 
that sits as a native uh, uh, daemon and just uh, can uh, log whatever you want, uh, just like time trackers. Uh, you know, what files you open, what programs you're on, when the computer's on and off, where it is. Uh, anything you want, uh, you, you select uh, LifeScope to record, it will record. Uh, and uh, we have a browser extension, and you just uh, go to a website, you know, like This Week in Tech, and I go and I tag it, uh, you know, track this page, track every major uh, uh, route, every u major URL on this page. Um, and, uh, and tag, uh, either like specific URLs or the domain, like, uh, this week in tech would be podcast, Leo Laporte, doc, you know, uh, tech. And, uh, now that's, that's semantically tracked in your record of this is the tech stuff you like. This is the, um, you know, uh, you went to the, this tech website, um, just by tagging it and recording it. Um, and that's what you can do for any data. Uh, life, life scope does nothing out of the box. Uh, you can sign up and have it record nothing and just play around with our features. But where you can be like a crazy person like me and uh, record absolutely everything I do, uh, everywhere I go, every website, every file, everything. And now my computer has a really good idea of, uh, you know, my, my life scope is a pretty good reflection of uh, what I do, who I talk to, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and has a lot of traces of my intent and uh, is predictive of what I'm going to do next. And since the computer now knows that, it can be much more responsive and interrogative with me. Um, and that's a lot of what we're doing right now is trying to make these like immersive, magical experiences where you can be, you know, uh, at times conversational with your with your digital devices. And at other times, it's just uh, uh, like a butler uh, predicting what you're going to do next, helping you do it, or suggesting something better to do. Um, and, you, and being able to have this type of like really intense AI, this really intensely data-driven experience without breaking your privacy is kind of the magic. It's, it's, it's how you sell this to people. It's the reason why Alexa is super cool, but it kind of sucks because it doesn't really know you, and it's also not trustworthy because you don't control it. What if all of that was the opposite? What, what if you could have it all the ways you want? So as you describe this, the, the the term that comes to mind is a personal wayback machine. And I, I yeah. assume most of our audience is, is familiar with, you know, the Internet Archive's wayback machine. You can punch in a URL and say, show me what this website looked like in, you know, 2001 and, and have this, you know, nostalgia trip. Or I often use it for, uh, you know, trying to find old data that people have, have erased for one reason or another. Just the other day, I was researching sysinternals, and there was a blog post on sysinternals from, you know, way back in the day. I needed to be able to read for some research I was doing and turned to the Wayback Machine and was able to get it. it. So is this project kind of a personal Wayback Machine? Yeah, yeah. So we, um, uh, I can tell you two, two things about this. One is uh, we built um, what we actually call the time machine. Uh, so if you go to lifescope.io slash XR, I think I, uh, um, you can go to lifescope.io and just look for the time machine. It's pretty, it's pretty apparent. Um, we built this 3D web experience, which is essentially uh, uh, a, a steampunk style Google Earth time machine uh, in web, web, web 3D and WebXR uh, that you and five friends can go in and uh, you can actually make stories of uh, your past. Uh, you can tag vacation, Hawaii, and tag all the photos, all the places you went, uh, you know, on our map. Um, and then you get into this VR experience and you and five friends can fly to Hawaii, go right over the beach and see the photos you took and see, oh, then I went, you know, from the Starbucks to the beach over to this restaurant where I had dinner and back to the hotel. And you can just fly over those areas along while looking at all the Websites you looked at the, on your phone, all the photo, you know, messages and and images you sent, uh, along with everything you posted to Instagram, just as like this very immersive digital story, um, and you can curate that out. Um, and now we're, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, we did one for the Magic Leap actually, uh, won an award, uh, a hackathon with the Magic Leap, um, uh, building the same thing, a, a steampunk time machine. Uh, powered by this data. It's, we kind of think of it as the sizzle and steak. Like we make something <laughs> see very cool to make the average person kind of really peek up and, and understand the potential of 
uh, having all of your information in a in a place in a singular place that's well organized and that you control. Like it, it could tr transform um, the software we make, make it much more personal, much more interesting, much more powerful. Um, so uh, the other one uh, that we did is when we actually kind of we've built like three versions of LifeScope now. Um, really, like at the, between building the first and second version, we did this experiment, uh, kind of user experiment, where we found people who hadn't seen the tech before, and we kind of asked them some questions about, like, do you have a Garmin, you know, old school GPS from early, early late 2000s? Do you have an Android phone? Do you uh, let it track your location? Do you have a ton of photos? And we'd find people with a ton of location data. And we'd, ha we'd white glove them in the life scope, help them make their own databases, connect all their data and get it in. And then we baked them an animation. And the animation was just them moving on a map. And it was uh, uh, like every day was about three seconds. A year was a few minutes. You could watch your entire digital life in like under 30 minutes. And uh, people would sit there and watch them go around on the map. Uh, and they would be like, work home, sleep work, home, sleep, restaurant, <laughs> work, home, sleep, restaurant, grandma's house, right? And people would watch it. And uh, most of them kind of would freak out at points because they would see like, oh, no, that's my ex-girlfriend or, oh, no, that reminds me of a bad time of my life or, oh, no, you know, that's my grandpa who died or something. You know, it's uh, uh, it's kind of crazy. Uh, the the like s sovereign introspection, look at the mirror uh, capabilities of when people have to look back at their own objective reality, not their like Instagram reality. So it's a, uh, it's crazy tool and we've had to make it really kind of fun and, uh, feel like safe for people, um, who use it. Um, and it's, it's still something we struggle with and, and we're also struggling with, uh, helping people when they a lot of times realize that, there's data out there that, you know, photos out there, things they said out there um, that they, uh, 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 they now want to delete now that they can actually find it. Um, it's something we're trying to help with as well. Um, it's, uh, it's really interesting to work in this type of personal data because uh, you start to realize how all of our information is in these broken, fractured silos that are not necessarily easy for us to get at. Like a lot of things that we can pull out of the Facebook API when you connect with Facebook are pretty damn hard to find on Facebook, especially if they were like unpopular posts or negative things you said. Um, it's just it, Facebook has the data, but it's really hard to get some of that stuff off your timeline. It's uh, uh, it, it's it's crazy the landscape of of data privacy right now, as I'm sure I know every everybody here on the on these shows talk about. Uh, so. Uh, there's so many different directions we could go with this, and I know Doc is chomping at the bits to to get back in and ask you some questions too. Y yeah. You you mentioned something though, my ears per perked up. Uh, people start their account and upload all this information to the cloud, and uh, you know there's yeah. an old saying that when when we say the cloud, it's just a shorthand way of saying someone else's computer or someone else's server. Indeed, <laughs> is it pos is it possible to to run this service uh, to get this this kind of same results uh, by setting an instance up on a, a local server so that someone can can really control all of that? Yeah. So um, essentially, we we have uh, uh, been working on getting this uh, uh, this technology. Uh, uh, in, in a box so that people could run it on a cluster of uh, probably two or three of the highest end Raspberry Pi 4s with eight gigs of RAM and and hook it up to a, a bunch of hard drives and it'll go. And we would essentially, uh, uh, like where we're really interested is uh, helping mature the technology, running a s service and support uh, company, may, uh, like premium subscription, uh, selling AI models or over the top like experiences um, and, uh, and apps on top of this, uh, while keeping it open source. Uh, the reason we've been focused on the cloud, it's because honestly, <laughs> uh, the, 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 tw the, the twit, uh, audience probably cares a lot more about privacy than most people. Most people just, uh, <laughs> they sign up because they find it cool. Um, we do a lot to make sure even we can't get at that data. Um, one of the things that's kept us from really being able to get the, um, uh, the, the open source tech to run 
uh, on uh, your own server is uh, we use uh, uh, Mongo Database and Lucene right now. Uh, they've been cutting us a really good deal with allowing us to uh, make everybody a large, you know, gigabit to ter uh, gigabyte to terabyte sized uh, text index of all their information, and giving us uh, Lucene search indexes, which is uh, if you guys ever do instant search on Google and you type in like cat and it's already suggesting answers and giving you results before you even hit enter. Uh, those are Lucene indexes. Those are uh, fast fast text indexes. And uh, 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 to get that to work well um, uh, for people and have like this kind of really good magical experience that they expect where they're, they're typing and getting results really quickly, um, it's best that we use the cloud and all this caching tech that we have. Um, we're working really hard to make the underlying storage tech uh, better, um, where we can do this real-time search. Um, and we actually have an alpha of it. I'm about to write a blog post all about it. And we're trying to make like uh, really targeting Raspberry Pi images, ARM, and, uh, and uh, PC ba and, and Linux space uh, 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 images uh, that you can just flash on any device. But uh, we're we don't have the biggest budget right now. Uh, if you guys want to help with that, it's all open source, and I'd love a pull request. <laughs> you know, if anybody's a, a programmer <laughs> out there, um, you know, uh, we're working very hard on this, um, uh, <laughs> and uh, it might it might take us about a year to get something really good and easy for everybody to just be able to flash on an old computer. Uh, but it's that's that's very much my dream. Uh, yeah. So, so Liam, a, a couple well, more than a couple of things, but one that occurs to me is because you're doing so many things and um, uh, the XR stuff, the, the background of LifeScope. Could you take your history that you just gave us and turn that into a 3D XR thing that people could go to on your? Yeah. Um, that'd be great. I mean, just as a service to everybody's listening, because um, navigating back through your compl complicated life and you're still a young guy is pretty, and, and, and you're doing some, so much cool stuff that, um, that I think it's going to, it's going to help people. Anyway, that's just an idea for you. The, oh, yeah, let me, um, let me tell you something real brief about that. Sure, um, go for it. So I have like a bunch of Google docs that are these kind of fun, good to tell stories about myself that I want to make into kind of time machine experiences and then have them be pages on my website, liambroza.com. That's it, which is like, like everybody's personal website, my, my website's in a bunch of pieces and my ambition outstrips my free time. And, uh, like, <laughs> but that's, that's very much what I want to do with, with life scope and, um, other people on our team have the same thing. They've actually, I've made some private, uh, uh, personal experiences, um, they're kind of rough. I'm not ready to show them yet, but my friends like them. Um, other people on the team have done it as well. Um, but yeah, and and you can do it as well. Uh, if anybody, it's it's very easy to contact me if you want uh, uh, me to take you through and show you how to uh, uh, collect info this all your digital information and and curate and tell stories with it. Um, I can sh I can show you on LifeScope. Uh, but yeah, yeah we, we should uh, take some, some with that in show notes. We need to do that. It's, yeah. it's, uh, I kind of want the time machine to be better. Like I really need it to sound like the millennium Falcon. I need like the weather to move <laughs> and I need the sky to turn. And we're about like six, seven months away from that. But, um, I'm not, it, you only get one first impression on this stuff. So I'm going to, when it's ready, I, I will be telling some stories in the time machine. Yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, well, the cool it, thing it, about, yeah, about geeks is they, you know, they don't just need a first impression. They want to go to your your repository and download, you know, what you're working on and patch it and the rest of it. That's uh, yeah, uh, yeah. We that, that's a you know, so that's that's a big that's a big part of this. I, I want to jump ahead to because what you're saying, two things. One is when I was in your XR space last weekend because you have parties in your <laughs> in your virtual space, uh, which is a lot of fun uh, to to. Yeah you know, create a little avatar and float around and, and so forth. But somebody was showing a screen that, that was emulating defragging a hard drive. And it just struck me as a metaphor that what, what you've got with your steampunk time machine is a way of defragging one's life. Cause it occurs yeah. to me, my life is fragmented, right? You know, I mean, yeah. it's, it really is a fragmented 
three dimensional, not fully, you know, there's no, there's no direct, there's a poor directory structure for it. Right. You know, yeah. and it's, it's, it's kind of like scattered on the floor, you know, for the most part. And the longer you've been around the more stuff like that, that's out there. So that's just a, a really great demo before we go too far into that, though, that would be a great digression along a path you're already on. I want to ask you about whether or not there's any synergy with or competition with what Tim Berners-Lee is trying to do with solid, because there's a similarity in a sense that you've got this pod, your life is in this pod. What, yeah. have you looked at that at all? Or is that a, yeah, no. So, um, I've, I've, Talked to Tim several times about LifeScope. I believe they're actually having a solid world uh, in a few days uh, where we're all publicly jumping on a Zoom and talking about all this. Um, yeah, he. So, so what Tim has with Solid is a is a standard, is a membrane to essentially describe if you had like a, a sovereign data store, uh, how uh, uh, how you would interact with it how you would use it for a source of identity, um, how you put things in, how you take things out. Um, it's, it's definitely like a 1.0. Um, kind of, kind of to like put a, a little bit of history on this. Uh, these ideas of personal information managers, personal knowledge managers have been around for a long time. In fact, like in the, in the, um, mainframe era, they were like way more popular and they kind of died in the PC era for like many reasons. Um, if you look back on it, um, but, uh, the, you know, uh, I think Tim, Tim stuff is an evolution of, I think, uh, uh, four or five things that came before it that you can definitely reference all kind of brought together. Uh, but thing that's interesting is it's got the most amount of momentum to go through like some major standards bodies and be like very broadly adopted by corporations, which would kind of own governments. Um, but, uh, uh, like the, I kind of started building LifeScope uh, before him and kind of independent to the side. In fact, I, uh, I ashamedly did not really take a, a attention to Solid to like late 2016, early 2017 uh, when it was uh, pretty far in uh, to development. And uh, uh, I realized like very quickly, it's kind of designed for for like whole greenfield apps to be built on top of it, but it doesn't really have a strategy to get the existing information out there, like your whole history, into it. It also has a problem where um, it is yet to be tested at scale, uh, where you're moving like gigabytes a second in and out of it. At, um, uh, it has doesn't really have like advanced search features. Um, uh, it there's no like there's good stuff as well. There's very good things. Um, and there might, and like what we're doing at LifeScope will probably be interoperable with solid. We'll probably just, we'll, we'll implement, implement the solid protocol, but to make our apps work and to do things like machine learning, we're going to have to add all these extra, um, uh, features, uh, to the tech. Um, that's, that's one of, that's kind of how we kind of, uh, compare to solid. It's probably going to be like a, a borging. Um, and I've actually talked to the solid team, um, about possibly submitting some of the search functionality, the uh, uh, data storage and sync functionality um, to the open community. Uh, there's been like other, you know, there's been other like politics in this space as well. Like one of the ones I talk about is the data transfer project, which is like this thing that the uh, GDPR, the European Union kind of forced on the big five tech companies to make their data interoperable and to make data exports better. But in my opinion and in my, and most of the solid community and free data community would agree, like all of the big tech actors are kind of bad. They have, uh, they're on one level or another kind of bad faith players in open data. They don't really want data export and data sync to be easy and uh, the ability for you to connect all this information across all of your different software because it, it, uh, it's a run for open source. It's a run to the, the cheapest data. It means that you can uh, kind of mix and match features and uh, it breaks all the walled gardens. So uh, it's, it's, it's weird that like the, uh, or it's, it's 
kind of rough for projects like ours because we have to fight um, to get access to information. I have to fight to get into an app store. I have to fight to get API access. I have to fight to make sure my browsers stay in the Chrome and Firefox store. And um, I have to fight um, if I want to scrape on a user's behalf, which has been proven to be legal, and I should be able to do, you know, I build tools that do that through browser extensions so I can get at my own Netflix history. Um, I have to fight Netflix to change my scraper so I can get at my own, you know, information at netflix.com slash history. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it, um, the data transfer project is set out by Apple, Google, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter to make it easy for you to pick up all your tweets and put them on Facebook, but it doesn't work. You can barely do photos between like one or two services, you know, three years in. And uh, the tech companies are like, we're really on this data privacy. We're going to be compliant with GDPR and, and CCPA and, and everything else. And they're moving at the speed of glaciers. They, you know, it's on us to really uh, take back our information. You know, so uh, Tim's got a component. I've got a component. Other people have great components, um, but it's it's going to take a lot more uh, people interested in the, in the problem people wanting to use solutions, people funding solutions, uh, uh, using solutions uh, like like these data vaults, these data safes, these sovereign data pods. Um, they go by a lot of names, uh, uh, knowledge stores, um, you know, uh, it, and that's not the way software works. Everybody talks a big game and then they're like, yeah, I'm going to build, I'm going to do that. But then they eventually end up building proprietary data <laughs> systems that have really crappy exports if no exports at all you know so uh yeah that's uh welcome to the software business you know so yeah. <laughs> Liam, it, it's interesting. You know, I've I thought about this for a while too. And, and you know, you look at all these these big tech companies and their their free services. Uh, and there's there's another saying that goes, you know, something like uh, if you're if you're using a service that's free, you're not the customer. Uh, <laughs> and, and you think about it, and our data is basically the asset that these companies use, and they package it together into a, essentially a product that can, then gets sold to advertisers, uh, essentially. And, and Thinking about that, I'm curious with the projects that that you're working on with LifeScope and and XR, what what does the business model there look like? What what is the asset? What is the product? How do you guys actually make money to be able to support the development? Well, um, we built the the time machine uh, uh, about two years ago. Now we started it, and it was like I had I had. Uh, um, really had a fascination with uh, data visualizations uh, going back to college. And I love building charts and graphs and maps and stuff and learning how all that was done. And, uh, you know, around 2010, uh, you really started to be able to do three, 3D stuff on the web. And uh, uh, WebGL came out um, around uh, 2014, 2015, as the Oculus Rift came out. Uh, people started playing around with 3D on the web to try to do VR on the web. And around 2017, it actually got pretty real. Um, and you could do, you could officially do VR on the web. Um, you know, 2018, 2019 rolled around. Now you can do AR and VR at the same time uh, on the web. And we started to see, um, you know, things like Janus and other other projects where you could actually build these social rooms. That's one of the things that gave us the idea for the um, for the time machine, I went. I saw Google Earth VR in like 2017, and I went, "Oh my God! What if I could just put LifeScope data in this and uh, make it like curatable uh, into stories and make it social? Oh my God! Look at this new web stuff. What if I could put it on the web? That would make it incredible." Um, so we just uh, started playing around with it in our free time, kind of as a hackathon. Uh, inside the you know West LA tech community, it kind of it's a little famous. Like people know about it. The videos have been passed around. It was, you know, popular. People gave it a lot of likes. And um, when COVID hit, uh, a lot of people knew of me around here. And I got like 60, 70 phone calls. And my friends got the same asking, hey, can you do a virtual event? Can you do uh, uh, like a virtual product launch, uh, a vert uh, 
uh, some sort of like virtual screening because uh, we love the whole 3D thing. We love the whole social thing. We tried it out. Um, so that's so uh, essentially what we've been doing recently is uh, what we call my XR social, these virtual 3D spaces like I took Doc to uh, based on some stuff that um, uh, that's in the open source community, some stuff Mozilla did, some other stuff that um, uh, that uh, Google did and our own stuff and mixing it together to make these uh, social 3D worlds where we all come to a URL and it's a 3D space. We can walk around, listen to music, watch TV, play with 3D models, go surf the internet together. And uh, in the age that everybody's locked in, this has become really cool. We've now talked to large companies that now want to do virtual conventions. They want to do virtual concerts. They want to do uh, uh, you know, virtual product launches, virtual mixers, virtual sales calls. Uh, uh, you know, product demos, um, retail, um, and uh, we're working together to to uh, uh, figure out how to actually do this at the quality and scale um, that that uh, is kind of needed to replace physical retail, um, you know, actual business processes and things in businesses, and uh, uh, privacy has become a, a real big problem, along with a weird existential problem, which is the more ambitious people in this space want it to be a kind of a different web experience where like if you know say we're all uh shopping for uh you know a table at our house and we would all come together on our own you know apple glasses ar ar headsets and go to form a, form a party between all of our web browsers and go to virtual eBay over here, virtual Ikea over there, virtual Amazon, and start swapping in and out coffee tables, look, you know, comparing looks, prices, quality, um, kind of in a virtual space. Or doing the same thing with uh, uh, you know, a professional workflow where we're trying to design a document or um, does, you know, uh, uh, make a movie and we all wanna bring our workspaces together into a common, common place and mix that with resources that are on you know websites uh, you know such as software, and that requires you to have like a very robust sovereign browser that has a wallet, has crypto in it that understands uh, um, you know your contacts, your friends, uh, your you know holding your identity, uh, holding all the sovereign information about like uh, uh, your preferences, the objects you own, the, the data you have access to to power the spatial website. Um, to, to actually have all the like, uh, integration you need to build like a really powerful immersive computing space. Um, so all the stuff we did at LifeScope is kind of predicated to building this next type of uh, 3D interface, immersive interface, if that makes sense. It's a little dense. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um so that's that's uh, that's a good overview of kind of the direction you guys want to go. But I'm I'm curious if you don't mind asking a very rubber meets the road sort of question. Uh, where does where does the money come from to be able to do oh, this? Money, I mean, there's, there's yeah, a, yeah, definitely. There's so, there's, a, there's a lot so, of us that have you know really cool ideas we want to work on, but we have you know oh, yeah. hashtag so, day jobs. So right now, <laughs> right now we're building the found the the very foundation of that. We are working on doing a big uh, uh, a, a couple big events in October that are going to be. Uh, like a virtual conference, uh, a, excuse me, a virtual concert, a uh, 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 a virtual like esports tournament, and a virtual single player re retail store. And we're working uh, with uh, a retail partner who is uh, funding the esports tournament and the concert, um, and making those uh, happen in social space on their website. And uh, they're hoping. They're use, we're going to help build a, uh, a really cool experience that drives uh, users into this virtual store that connects them to an actual store where they can buy, uh, e, you know, uh, uh, e-commerce store where they can buy uh, 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 virtual uh, real products and virtual products and, uh, uh, and content. And we've, we've been talking to a bunch of other companies going into the fall season, uh, going into big product launches at CES next year about building these virtual spaces uh, for them so uh, people can experience uh, 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 virtual commerce, uh, you know, interaction with, with, uh, with company leaders. Um, and 
the 3D foundation that we're building of that is all going to be open source. Um, and it's going to be built future forward uh, for the software we're building. And as we kind of do these very basic projects over the next, uh, you know, into the summer, into the fall, into January, uh, into Q1 of next year, the, in the winter, um, we're, uh, we're looking at doing even taking that money, taking some time building this, uh, 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 building this tech out even more and going for more ambitious projects that we've talked to, to people in the long term and really bridging uh, life scope and, and uh, what we're doing in 3D. Um, uh, really, uh, and, and a lot of uh, other stuff in human prediction that we did last year uh, with some other clients uh, where we we used a lot of uh, what we've learned at LifeScope and, and done before and what's really best in the industry uh, to understand uh, people's behavior uh, a lot better. Uh, if once you have a lot of personal information um, that's clean, complete, and up-to-date um, and highly accurate, you can predict, uh, you can Look, look at somebody's past of where they went, who they talked to, what they did, and predict uh, uh, you know, what they're going to do next, where they're going to go next, what they're going to say next, um, and uh, use that for uh, suggestion, anomaly detection, uh, all, all sorts of things. And uh, we've done a lot of uh, projects around that, um, really taking everything we learn and uh, 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 making it free to use for people. Uh, you know, we're really a consultancy. We do uh, projects for other people, um, and uh, we we also spend a lot of our time, uh, uh, you know, kind of what we call in the bullpen, uh, building principal technology, and uh, you know, like LifeScope, um, and that's really what pays the bills. You know, um, it's you know, up. We weren't actually going to go do these virtual event platforms this year. Uh, our plan was to raise a ton of money and uh, uh, for LifeScope and build uh, all sorts of personal AI on top of the tech, open, you know, uh, Alexa killers, because um, when uh, with all this information, uh, I can build a heat map of, you know, like a hurricane track of where I'm going to go next. I can build uh, a differential histogram of what I'm going to do next. I can build a chat bot that can give me three or four uh, estimates of what I'm going to say next, um, allowing me to, uh, you know, uh, automate myself, uh, uh, delegate, um, uh, really uh, accelerate my work with this personal AI that knows what I'm going to do, gonna do and can help uh, help me do it faster, do it better. Um, that was a lot of, of what we were going to raise money and, and do this year. But uh, COVID kind of changed everything. It's a it's a weird time to raise money. Uh, it didn't feel like the right time to to build uh, the AI we were building. Um, we wanted to look at the, the, the crazy digital transformation that's happening right now in business, um, where everything's becoming virtual, insert ourselves into that, understand it, and then apply what we know about LifeScope to that problem. And we're doing that through a set of projects. Um, so yeah, hope that answers it. Yeah. <laughs> we have clients. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> you have clients. That's the short answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's there's kind of two threads here, and people in the chat room are going back and forth about this. Uh, interestingly, that uh, there's there's one I think uh, there's one line of thought that says that oh we've seen virtual reality a couple of times in the past before. It's just going to be a flash in the pan. It's just making the web heavier. Uh, you know, ideas like yeah. that. And and thinking about that, I'm wondering, is COVID uh, the killer app for virtual reality uh, are kind of the the virtual conferences and all of this because we're all stuck at home going to be the thing that makes it stick this time. Well, I would step back and say um, what's really happening with with XR and Web XR is that uh, everything's becoming more immersive. I think virtual reality is an aspect of that. I uh, I would expect to see a lot more TVs. And uh, general devices with cameras and microphones uh, attached to screens that will allow me to have a much more immersive display as I move around. We're moving into, uh, you know, light light fields like Looking Glass and Leia. We're uh, we're moving into AR displays powered by face tracking and computer vision that give perspective AR. Uh, projection mapping is becoming consumerized, where you can have projectors, uh, you know, big spherical projectors that turn every room, every surface in your room 
uh, into a display um, that I imagine in the next five years you'll see as LEDs. Um, AR glasses are coming. I have Magic Leaps. I have an Unreal. I have played with the HoloLens too. Um, you know, this, you know, optical technology is coming. Apple's got something, uh, you know, Vuzix has stuff. Everybody has stuff out in the wild right now. Um, I played with, with all of them. Uh, I think it's got a massive wave, uh, of, of AR is coming that, uh, is going to, uh, uh, hit us just like the iPhone. Uh, it's coming very soon. And, uh, our AR glasses will be our VR glasses. They will, either have blast shields that we clip on or magnet on, or <laughs> they just can go dark like transition lenses and become VR glasses. And uh, that's really what we're in, to, in for, for between now and 2030. That and like uh, a world just powered by massive amounts of computer vision and machine learning. Um, and like VR is a really great test bed of where that's going. Um, it's an enclosed, totally controlled, 3D, 4D space, social space, um, in which you can build the tech for that world. And that's kind of why we're focused on it. The web, the web is either going to get ready for that world or it's not, you know, uh, if you, you, you don't like that web cause it's, it's getting too heavy. Well, there's ways you can build it completely responsive. You know, there's no way there's, there's ways you can extract out an RSS feed out of a, out of a, social web xr space if you find <laughs> if you don't if you don't want to burn through your phone's battery you know uh, uh there you know or listen in like a walkie talkie um it's uh, uh it in my opinion like like web xr is about uh is is really about um an immersive responsive real-time web um that's that's like the software we're, we're using right now skype you know that, that that's integrated into this experience and driving and accelerating this experience. Um, uh, and instead of me just staring at this, uh, uh, screen right now, uh, with the, with, you know, I, I could take you on a tour. My house is covered in cameras and tracking and all sorts of AR gear, like, uh, uh, with the next few iterations of technology, uh, you know, I could, uh, we're going to see like an ability for me to walk around this house and take you on a tour of my photogrammetrized, uh, photogrammetry uh, 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 captured space um, using virtual cameras that are cutting me through, you know, cutting me through uh, uh, all the different cameras and zooming in. Like this is this is where stuff's going. I've been to, uh, you know, projection mapped labs. I've been to caves. I've I've seen all this super advanced telecommunication tech. Um, and it's going to be consumerized. It's going to be in the bezels of televisions. It's going to be built into security systems. It's going to be built into the, you know, Alexa and Facebook uh, hardware that's coming. Um, it's it's really about who's going to control that. And I'm trying to build an open source version of that. Um, I don't think focus VR VR is going to get very cheap, very light. Um, uh, it's going to have much better focal planes, much better. Uh, uh, much better accommodation for people uh, who need glasses and with different pupil distances um, and different head shapes uh, very soon. Those problems are getting solved. So I think that there's going to be a much bigger general audience for VR very soon. I think the PlayStation VR is rocking it and really showing that it's it's here to stay, um, at least in some form. Um, and uh, I've seen so much in enterprise training adoption, too, that makes me think it's really going to it's going to take over training and large parts of, uh, of experiential education. Uh, so yeah, that would, I hope that's a, a good answer. <laughs> wow. Uh, it yeah. is, it's, it's, it's good answers. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and all of them raise too many questions for us to, to take in the time we have left. So I, and I don't want to go too long into digression here because we're going to, we're getting down to the end of the hour, but, um, I've thought as a sports fan that I'm just amazed when the the sports commissioners of the big leagues say, well, we can't have any fans here. When fans want to pay, and and, and I'm wondering if um, if what you've got is part of a solution that one of the bigs, because you don't have the scale to do it yet, um, 
a, an Apple or a Zoom or or a Microsoft with Microsoft Teams, which is bragging about being able to bring 70,000 people together or something like that, of, of putting fans in, in virtual stands. Can, that be, can this be done? Is this a thinkable thing? And I mean, because I would so, think that there's so a lot of So I have a theory there. on what's going on here. Okay. This will probably get me into trouble, but I don't care. No, um, you. there's a <laughs> not with us. <laughs> Nobody else is here. It's okay. It's safe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Who wants on, buddy? <laughs> yeah. Um, so this company called Next VR that was bought by Disney, and they had a lot of really big VR contracts with all the major, um, uh, you know, uh, major league sports, uh, uh, and uh, they are. Uh, they they're off the face of the planet right now, you know. Uh, they're just bought by Disney and then, poof, you know, their apps disappeared from the Oculus Store. I think that Apple has something to do with it. I think that maybe Facebook as well has something to do with it, and that there are you know mega billion dollar forces at play, uh, doing working on sports right now, because uh, I think everybody saw that one really quickly. And um, I think that something really big is going to happen. And um, like the monopoly has already been decided like a year before, years before it came out. <laughs> and and so, who is that monopoly? It's, it's Disney plus Apple. Surely plus was something maybe, maybe, Facebook, maybe Facebook. Yeah. And, maybe and I think Facebook. they're all in cahoots to, to, to lock that, that stuff down. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that that. <laughs> I, I've been talking to a lot of people and showing them stuff, and they're like, oh, that's really cool, but we're doing something else. It's not as cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's – well, that's good. That's good. So that, that gives us a sense that just of what's leaves, – That just leaves me absolutely everything else to, as, a, as a possible use of what I'm doing. So, <laughs> Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a gigantic space. I mean I think if yeah. you're right, <laughs> one of the things you've done a very good job of in answering Jonathan's question, I think is, and maybe I've, I haven't looked at the back channel. He's been looking, but um, uh, at the, our chat room, that it, this is a for real thing. That it's a matter of time before we have the the headgear, basically. That I already played with it. It's out there. That, 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 I mean, <laughs> it, it, basically, it starts obsolescing television great. as we knew it. That starts obsolescing the rectangles that we've been inhabiting for a long time. You know, what's the next, what's the next thing that's not a rectangle? You know, because we live in the rectangular world. Our phones are rectangles. These things are rectangles. You know, most of the people consuming this, to speak of it, uh, are, are actually listening. You know, so they're, well, in, they're, I, I, they have more I, dimensions in their heads, but go. Yeah, I put go. on haptic gloves that let me feel things that aren't there and feel them hot or cold and rough and soft. I put on a Tesla suit <laughs> that'll lock my arm up when I when I'm hitting a wall, and I've had the one of the developers for it punch make me punch myself in the face because this thing was controlling my body and giving me hot, cold, and rumble haptic feedback when I'm getting shot in the virtual world. And they it's got pants and shoes. I've been on on omnidirectional treadmills that are like proactive and very much screw with with your brain and all sorts of other crazy tech. I've been hooked up to BCI machines while in VR. It's all coming and it all I can attest it works. <laughs> You're the advanced team. It's, You're the advanced yeah, it, team. No, yeah. it, you don't have That's to look very hard show. to or yeah. ask very many people to be able to try this now. It's pretty well proliferated. Like uh, it's it's wild. Yeah. It's okay, coming. so yeah. so we have a and we're actually very close to being at the end of this thing. Um we actually have final four questions we always ask. One is, and the first is, what haven't we asked that you'd like us to have asked that you can answer fairly quickly? Um, uh, pass. I think I, I just talked about what I wanted to talk about. Go on. Let's. <laughs> Great. The second is blockchain. Yes, that's sort of a control question. We ask everybody where they stand or what they're doing with blockchain. What do I Either stand one. on blockchain? Uh, creating uh, verifiable distributed ledgers seems very useful. As far as a monetary policy, uh, uh, I I don't know about that. Um, I think there's, I think that blockchain and Bitcoin and Ether and contracts have all opened up very interesting discussions about the decentralization, about encryption, about verifiable credentials, about distributed identifiers, about distributed verifiers. Um, that's great. I 
am not sure anything that exists today or is being used in a major way is the final solution. I think that there's some ideas out there that might be right. DIDs are very interesting. Secure data vaults are very interesting. Uh, you know, I wish something like Ether and EOS um, could like uh, worked the way they want it to work. Um, it'd be a great dream for them to be like a decentralized alternative to, uh, uh, AWS. It'd be very interesting if there was a decentralized currency or way to move reputation or something, you know, as a monetization or trust as a monetization or, or as a, as a digitization of trust or I keep saying monetization. Uh, but I don't know. Blockchain is very strange. The more I, I read about it, the more I'm perplexed. <laughs> So. That's good. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Jonathan just wrote in the, the thing and thinks may, that Git may have been the first blockchain. I can yes. see that actually. Yes, that you know, I I run my life on Git. So uh, I you know, laws written in Git sound like an interesting idea. I've heard that one before. You know, um, so yeah I, yeah, I think the amazing thing to me about Git is that. Um, lightning struck twice for Linus Torvalds. I mean, first he, first he invents the operating system we're all using. Then he invents this other thing that everybody's also using in order to write I, every code base there is. Pretty amazing. Uh, can we all be so lucky? Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, I, and a, a final pair of questions. What's your favorite text editor and scripting language? Oh, um... <laughs> I have a weird uh, uh, hate-love relationship with Python, um, and uh, I use a lot of Markdown in VS Code nowadays. I hate to admit, uh, not the most open <laughs> floss thing in the world, but yeah, that's what I'm doing all day long. Um, so, but yeah, I, 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 everything's in Markdown on my computer. So, uh, from VS Code. So. <laughs> Well, that's cool. So I, I should say is, Vim, but just, it, I should have yeah. lied and just said Vim. But it's really VS Code. So <laughs> <laughs> would have got me a lot more credit in the comments, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> so okay. Well, it has been absolutely awesome having you on the show, and and we have to have you back. I say this to everybody, but I mean, you've uncorked so many topics and done it. Uh, so well, and I and again, I'm I'm serious about like taking everything you said here, or you just touched on, and turn it into your space, uh, and I and I hope Jonathan and others can can experience your your XR space too because it's pretty cool. And something we awesome. didn't touch on yeah. is, is is how deep you are with the with Mozilla and this thing. They're they're involved in this, and well, you know, I. Um... I, I bug them on their servers. I've talked I've talked to many people uh, uh, at Mozilla about this over the years. I very much try to ask them a ton of questions, get their blessing. We very we've we've been uh, pull requesting code to them, submitting issues. It's it's become like a a bit of a relationship. Same thing with you know I have to to give a shout out to like the three JS community, which has you know predates all of this and. Uh, um, you know, uh, the Janus web community, which was the first people to do the VR on the web. And we, we went to all of them. Um, and, uh, and, uh, you know, there's also the Webiverse. there's all, all their other great, great groups, um, to build what we're building to, uh, uh, to, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a huge collaboration. I'm just one touch of a whole network of people doing this. I, I'm, so, I'm really curious yeah. to see how many of our of our listeners and viewers want to jump on and to what you're doing and and get involved. Please help. Uh, get on our Discord. Yeah. Uh, find yeah. us. You know, tweet. You know, tweet at me. I'll. I'll. That's you know, right. We'll you're, you're 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 listening at Discord too. So it's all. <laughs> yeah, we live on Discord. So um, yeah. we live we live on Discord and GitHub. That's pretty much how we're doing this. It, it, it's that's where we're all all roads align. We, I think we have yeah. more with you on show notes that, than anybody else we've ever had on. Well, thanks an awful lot, Liam, for being on here and uh, and, and on Floss Weekly. This has been a a terrific. It's been a pleasure. A Thank hour. you for letting me talk. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> thanks. So, Jonathan, deep breath. Where how 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 do you process all of that? 
<laughs> Liam is quite the bundle of energy. He's tough to keep up with. <laughs> uh, he's got he's got two really interesting threads here that I think, uh, and the way that he's woven them together is really interesting too. So he's got he's got this idea of let's use machine learning and you know big database and and all of these things to essentially let people manage their own data, create a timeline of their data, their personal experiences, their pictures, all of these things, put them together uh, to really to have some sovereignty over your data and still get some of the same experiences that you can get with, you know, the different Google applications on the web uh, and some of the Facebook things. That thread is extremely cool that they're doing it in open source. And then they've got this separate thread over on the other side that says, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality is the wave of the future. Let's let's really dive into that. Let's do it with open source tools, uh, which is also really, really interesting. And then the fact that they're taking them and they're putting them together in these neat experiences. I think that's just amazing. Um, and, and again, you know, we were kind of going back and forth in the in the chat room, in the back chat about, well, you know, the, the VR stuff, it's just it's 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 just making the web heavier. It's a flash in the panel of this. And yeah, that might be right. But the fact that we're able to do the fact that somebody's out there putting these things together in an open source way, you know, whether it sticks around or not, is it's just it's really cool. And it's it's uh, it's encouraging that, you know, this stuff is being developed uh, in the open source world as well as just, you know, locked away proprietary and, and big companies. I, I think it's neat to see. Yeah, I uh, I was very excited to have Liam on the show because, um, you know, I deal with a, a, a lot of startups and a lot of them are trying to do this stuff I've been talking about for a long time, which is flattering and all that. And, and his is the first where I really get a sense of huge potential coming out of it that is really like, you know, like in, in, in comedy improv, you say yes and, right? And you never say no to anything. And he does that with like everything. Like there's a big pile of stuff. He's doing all this all this different stuff. And I actually have never been a big fan of VR, mostly because um, I just can't imagine clamping a thing on my head and walking around with it, you know. And uh, and I generally like new tech of all kinds, but it's like, okay, that's a little bit like, uh, it's just too weird. You know, there's only so many things a person's willing to wear on their body. Um, and glasses <laughs> is going pretty far. I mean, I wear glasses for this just because I have these for this screen, but most of the time I don't wear glasses at all. And, and you know, the, the thought of having a thing on my head, but he sold me to, some, you know, even more than he usually does uh, with this today. I think there's a, and I think he's right that, um, I mean, Apple has been curiously silent on this and they really need the next big thing. I mean, they they really do. And I, I hate to see something fully proprietary come out or that Google has one and Apple slash Facebook have the other. Um, you know, like there are four uh, captains of technology that, that are going to be speaking to Congress today, probably you're speaking right now, you know, and they're looking to break those up or something like that. And I'm thinking, you guys have no idea what's coming next. You know, that's the thing you should be worried about or putting your faith in. They're, you know, they're, and it's probably not even going to come from the the biggest coolest things may not even come from them. They come from the Liam's of the world. You know, I mean, Liam today is what Tim Berners-Lee was 30 years ago. Um, and there are others like him, but what I like about what he's doing is that he's, he comes from the floss world. He comes from the let's all be sovereign world, uh, rather than the, how can I control the universe world? And that's, that's different. He doesn't want to build an evil empire. He just wants to do good in some fun ways. So, so what have you got to plug? Because we're gonna uh, sure. So I'll 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 mention my uh, my weekly security article over at hackaday.com. Uh, it runs every Friday morning. You guys can check it out. I, I do kind of a roundup of uh, what's going on for the week, and uh, I think we've actually got a story that we're gonna break. As far as I know, nobody else has covered this yet. A uh, a data breach somewhere. Maybe a company you haven't heard of, but uh, uh, we're gonna be taking a look at that uh, this Friday. That one may run a little earlier. I'm not sure yet. Uh, but anyway, keep, keep an eye out for my work over on Hackaday. That's cool. Um, I mean, my only plug is customer comments again. Um, uh, watch that space. There's nothing showing up too much on it right now. If you look at my blog, I have uh, I've been doing something that has had very little response, but um, but those who have listened to it, I've been trying audio blogging, just like I'm going to put on my blog. That's just if you go to doc.searles.com, that's the short. The short link to something that's much longer at Harvard, um, which is host host the thing, um, that are just some thoughts about where we're going and what's going on. So that's my my little plug. 
So I want to also plug next week. Um, uh, we have uh, um, coming in. I have to click on the thing here <laughs> to make sure I get the right one. Uh, but coming, it was Wes Turner for the Rensselaer Center for Open Source. And they're doing some really uh, cool things in the academic world around around open source. So uh, looking forward to that next week. So uh, thanks a lot, Jonathan. And thanks a lot, Liam. And thanks a lot for tuning into another Floss Weekly. Hi, I'm Jason Howell, host of All About Android. Each week, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Ron Richards and Florence Ion, as well as a whole rotating cast of guests, journalists in the Android space, experts, developers, and even people working on Android behind the scenes at Google. Uh, we talk about everything that has to do with Android, and you don't want to miss a single episode so you know what it's going on behind the scenes. That's twit.tv AAA. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. 